Hello and welcome. You are listening to The Investor Lab, the auditory epicenter for passionate people seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. My name is Goose, and on today's show, I'm joined by Gabby, and we talk about the changing environment for property investors and how you should be thinking differently about your strategy as you go into 2023. We talk about the importance of thinking about your portfolio with a concept called modern portfolio theory. We also talk about an analogy of how property investors have been racing down a racetrack and now they're going into the windy bits and how you can become more successful because of that, not despite that. And so we talk about a lot of different things, how to shift your mindset, how to think about structuring your portfolio and how to become more limber in your approach. So if you're a property investor that is kind of wondering like, what the hell do I do now? Like things have changed a little bit in the last 12 to 18 months. What am I going to do with my portfolio? Well, then this is absolutely for you. I hope it's valuable. And of course, make sure that you like, rate, review, share, share this with a friend, family member, a loved one. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're on Spotify, hit subscribe. If you're anywhere else, make sure you click the buttons, whatever's clicking around you and send this to someone as well. It would mean the world to me and everybody else here. But that's enough for me. Let's get stuck right into it. I'll see you on the inside. Hey guys, welcome back to the Investor Lab. Joining me on today's show is Gabby. Gabby, how are you? I'm excellent, my love. How are you? I am very well, thank you. It's been um, a little while since we've been on the show together. It's always nice to do an episode with you. What's been happening? I feel honoured, to be honest, to be re <laughs> reinvited to spend a bit of time with you. We don't spend enough time together, so I'm excited. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Do you want to tell everyone where we are right now? Like, do you want to, should we, I mean... The hint for is sure. in the fact that so I have we a Starbucks. Are in, <laughs> we are in another world known as the United States of America. It's a very interesting place. I'll say that. It is a very interesting place. What is really interesting is the differences as well in the uh, in the property investing sector. It's just such a, like, intellectually, you can kind of understand it and you go, okay, cool. They do things a little bit differently over here. But then once you're actually on the ground and you start talking to property investors, it's a completely different game. You know, that's probably the topic of a whole other uh, podcast episode, which I'd like to get into. I really think that there are a lot of benefits in being a property investor in the US that we could benefit from in Australia. Very different market dynamics, but um, nonetheless, I think it's fascinating so far. Yeah, for sure. It's super interesting because you, you speak to people here about, you know, it's real estate here. It's not property. You don't say property. It's real estate. We're going to not try and do another accent. <laughs> that estate. was terrible. <laughs> Real estate, but you you speak about property, and because it's much more prolific here, based on it's just easier. The prices are cheaper, generally speaking, than in Australia. So there's a lower cost of entry, and then like serviceability in terms of how do people actually finance purchases, much easier in the US. So typically, people that are really into property investing have more property. So when you talk about like you know most people in Australia get stuck at one or two, they're like, what do you mean? How do you get stuck? That doesn't make sense. So yeah. it's totally different. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting. And it's probably that's a good segue into um what we want to talk about today, actually, because you know, like there's there's a lot of different strategies and different approaches to building a property portfolio in different parts of the world and you know, for different people and all of that kind of stuff. And what I really want to talk about today is the changing uh environment for property investors in Australia, not in the US, uh, but in Australia, and how people can think about navigating that. And let me um let me just kind of like riff for a second, Gabby, and then maybe we can kind of like start dissecting it and pulling it apart. How does that sound? Great. Go for it. Awesome. Okay, perfect. So one of my favorite quotes is by Winston Churchill, and he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? No, oh, the end of that is, what, what do you do, madam? I really like that because the, the context around that is that the most astute uh, investors or in fact thinkers are the ones who are the most limber in their thought based on the realities realities of the facts and environment um, that they face, that they see around them. And I see that playing out right now in the um, in the Australian property market. Now, we have individuals and as an organization and as a podcast <laughs> talked um, quite proactively around the idea of optimizing for cash flow and growth kind of at the same time, if you can. And so, that has been possible and practical over the last few years. But with the changing environment, I think it requires that people don't abandon the concept of having a balanced portfolio of cash flow and growth, but maybe start to, they're going to need, I think, to start thinking a little differently around how they achieve that macro outcome. And so the way that I like to think about it is that over the last few years, 
property investors have been on a racetrack. So just imagine you're you're on a racetrack, everyone's racing their car down the track. Over the last few years, with interest rates being low and you know a, a highly liquid environment with quantitative easing and a whole bunch of other stuff, people have been screaming down the straight. You know, they've been on the straight, they've had their foot to the floor, just absolutely tearing down the straight. And it kind of you are able to go quickly, make a lot of moves, and you were kind of able much more easily to be able to thread the needle between cash flow and growth. And you were able to get much more easily get both combinations of characteristics in a single asset, which is highly desirable. Of course, if you can get a high growth asset, which also delivers good cash flow and good yields, then like that's the golden ticket, right? So however, what's happening now is that it feels like what's happened is we've gotten to the end of the straight and we're just heading into the chicanes. We're heading into the into the windy section of the track. And what I'm seeing is property investors aren't adapting to the changing race conditions. And so some property investors are still trying to act as if they're tearing down the straight. And they're like, well, why is it? This isn't working from they're going off track. Or you've got investors who are getting to the end of the straight and going, well, look at these corners. I don't know what they are. All I've known is how to drive down the straight section of the track. And so they're not actually tactfully and strategically working out, okay, how do I go through this next section of the track. Now, when you're on the straight in a race car, like by and large, the only differentiation of who's going to go faster on a straight section of the road is going to be the vehicle that you're in. In the context of property investors, that's going to be things like how much cash do you have? How much access to capital? How much access to borrowing capacity? Like what is your personal wealth vehicle? What's the structure of that? What does that look like? Are you able to go faster than somebody else based on the fuel that you've got in your engine, basically? But the races aren't won and lost on the straights. You know, that's where the fastest driving happens, but that's not where the, where the races are won and lost. The races are won and lost in the windy sections where it actually comes down to skill and strategy. You know, it's the drivers who are the most able, able to deftly maneuver through those sections that make the biggest gains so that then when they're on the straights, they're already ahead. And the thing about racetracks is they're circular, right? And so you go through the winding sections, then you get back around onto the straights and it's the winding sections that differentiate the winners from the losers. And I believe we're in a winding section right now. Now, that doesn't mean that it's bad. That's nothing to be scared of. It just means you need to change your driving style, which I think is really interesting because what that actually does is changes the context around how you should be thinking about your property portfolio. And I promise I'm going to shut up in a second, Gabby, and you'll be able to get a word in edgeways. But the way to think about that is with a concept called modern portfolio theory. So modern portfolio theory, I think I might have talked, spoken about it on the podcast before as well. Modern portfolio theory is, is it's a method for portfolio management that's designed to reduce risk, right? So Harry Markowitz won a Nobel Prize for coming up with this concept. And the, the idea, if you want to just Google it, you can see some kind of pictures of it, but there's basically a risk-free rate of return yield curve, which is typically associated with government bonds because they're like the lowest, you know, treasury bonds and stuff because they're like the lowest risk uh, return asset profile you can get. Typically, modern portfolio theory is spoken about in the context of like hedge funds and big, you know, big companies like that where they have the ability to buy smaller amounts of more things, right? But effectively, if you had 100 shares in 100 different companies, each one of those shares would have a different profile on a, a risk axis and a return axis. And the returns could be typified by um, growth and yield. And so you start to then create a matrix of where any individual asset would sit on an axis in terms of its risk profile and also its uh, rate of return profile. And that's a really way for a uh, really interesting way for property investors to be thinking about their portfolio. So if you think that most property investors, well, I say most, the property investors that we've worked with, put it that way, <laughs> over the last over the last few years have been able to um, get a highly optimized asset type, which is kind of like really good yields and really, uh, really good growth, which is a really good combination of returns and also a lower risk profile, which is awesome. What I think is going to be required for property investors, particularly in 2023 and moving forward as well, is a way to think about how to structure your portfolio to get the right combination of characteristics in a variety of different assets. Again, I promise you I'm going to shut up in a second, but I've just got like I'm pulling on a thread with this thought, Gabby, and then uh, and then I promise I'm going to shut up. <laughs> but like what what is what no, is what to. is really interesting? <laughs> what is really interesting is what I think is required in the current environment is that people act counterintuitively and invest counterintuitively in many cases. And so what I see happening a lot in the investment sector right now is that investors are chasing yields, which makes sense because interest rates have gone up. So interest rates have gone up, nominal access to cash flow has gone down, and so property investors are seeking higher yields. But here is the problem with that. 
We literally analyzed, we took every suburb in the entire country, we ranked it by yield, right? So highest yield to lowest yield. And then we went through the top, whatever it was, 50 or 100 of the 100 suburbs or whatever. And what we identified was that number one, some of them you don't want to invest in because they are not investable locations. They are like really weird outback towns with no good characteristics. Or if they are worth investing in, we were already buying in those locations. Yet here's the thing. Many of those locations that are still in the top yielding locations in the country, but also meet the um, characterization of being still investable at the same time, are still, in, for mo- in many cases, many cases, not producing positive cash flow. And then, so then what I'm actually, what, what you then can deduce from that is that the push to get higher yields to get cash flow could actually be chasing a fool's gold in the current environment. And therefore, people might be making investment strategy decisions based around something that may not actually be attainable. And I see a lot of this happening with um, property investment companies and professionals who have long purported the benefits of buying blue chip stuff in the middle of Sydney and all of that kind of stuff, now saying, let's go for yield. And they're buying, they've gone from buying 2% yielding assets in Bondi to 4% percent yielding assets in Brisbane, and they're trying to say that that is a good um, yield and cash flow play, but it just fundamentally is not because you're going to be cash flow negative anyway. And so then if you get to ask the question, well, you get to ask plenty of questions. One is like, should I keep investing or not? And if I were to keep investing, how would I keep investing? So these are the thoughts that are rolling around in my mind, Gabby, and um, I know there was a lot of ground there, but uh, did you want to dig into any of that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, it's it's a really important thing for people to be thinking about, right? Because I think we hear diversification and it sounds pretty obvious what that means, but there's kind of diversification in terms of protecting your downside. So that's how most people think about it. They diversify so you have a different asset types, different asset classes, so that if something goes bad, it doesn't wipe out the majority of my portfolio or my, or my wealth. But there's also the diversification in terms of the maximizing the upside, which is kind of in this situation where it's like, if you are going to continue to invest, it's understanding that different asset types and different portfolio strategies and different asset classes perform better at different points in cycles, not the cycle, multiple cycles, different points. And really thinking like, if I'm going to keep playing, like you said, the question is like, am I still going to keep investing or am I going to pause right now? Rather than putting your foot down and going, well, I only get high yielding assets that are always cash flow positive. That's my thesis. I'm going to go with that forever. When you enter a different kind of market, then you end up making mistakes, like you said, buying the wrong types of asset purely because you're trying to chase something that doesn't exist in that environment. Exactly right. But here's the thing, like all of the things can exist, but it's about whether or not you're conscientiously choosing the characteristics based on what is best for your portfolio or some other reason. So for example, let's just say you went, well, I'm only going to buy assets that are yielding high enough for them to be positive cash flow. You could end up buying somewhere up in the Gulf of Carpentaria or something like that, some you know far-flung middle of nowhere town just to get a yield, but then you could end up having like macro a wholly underperforming asset and unknowingly have exposed yourself to a much higher risk profile. And so even though you have a reward from it, the risk-free rate of the return is probably negative, right? And so that would be then a suboptimal choice. But then you get to ask yourself as well, okay, so for some people, there's going to be literal, genuine cash considerations around, okay, maybe I have a family and I have a budget and we can save some money, but we don't have a surplus amount of cash flow that if our properties are cash flow negative, we're just going to be able to start dumping in heaps of cash. Or maybe maybe there's an allowable amount of uh, cash flow negativity that you could support in a first year. And you've got to take that kind of thing into consideration. Now, a couple of things on that. Number one, I believe that the current situation is transient. And I have been very vocal about that for some time. (laughs) Um, Since early last year, I was saying, hey, guys, rates are going to go up. And then they're not going to go up for too long. They're going to flatline and then they're going to go down, even in the middle of last year. And I believe that we will start to see that kind of that formation through this year, which is in line with what I was saying would happen last year. So I believe that it's that it's transient. So the question you get to ask yourself is, do I just want to sit on my hands and wait for the environment to change to suit my situation? Or in fact, could I or should I think differently in order to keep going as fast as I can to get to my goals as fast as possible. And so a couple of ways that that could transpire. Now, if you have surplus cash and surplus financial capability, 
you could actually take a counterintuitive approach and actually buy assets not based on yield at all, but based on growth. Now, that does not mean that you inversely then go and try and find 2% yielding properties on some you know, misguided belief that lower yields equal higher growth. That is not a, that is like so far from being fact um, that you would make a, a bad decision. However, potentially instead of chasing like a, a 5.5, 6, 6.5, 7, 7.5% yielding um, asset, Perhaps you could say, well, if I'm not going to get cash flow, that's fine. Why don't I just choose the asset that's going to get me the maximal optimized return, which could end up being an asset which has got, I don't know, four, four and a half percent yield and be in a really good growth location based on a bunch of other growth fundamentals. So again, that doesn't mean just go chase low yields. It means make a decision based around the growth prospects versus based around the cash flow prospects. The other thing you get to think about is you get to think, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, I just want to, so let's let's pull on that thread. Let's imagine like you're listening to this episode. You've got mm. maybe one or two properties. They've just kind of tipped over into negative because rates have gone up. They exceeded the rent. You're a little mm. bit negative now. Let's say you want to keep playing. What would you do? How would you approach that? Great question. It's such a great question. And this is the question that property investors need to keep asking themselves, right? How do I keep going? Not, oh, I'm out of the game. It's like, well, how? How do I keep playing the game? And so then you get to ask yourself a few different questions. What is the specific bottleneck? So the theory of constraints gets applied to your portfolio. And if you are starting to find a bottleneck in, and if anyone's interested in reading a book about the theory of constraints that is genuinely entertaining and is one of my favorite books of all time, go and look up The Goal by Eli Goldratt. I promise you it's an amazing book. It's so much fun. You wouldn't think it would be based on the theory of constraints, but, <laughs> but it genuinely is a fantastic read. Anyway. Back to the point. So you get to look at your portfolio and say, well, what specifically is the constraint that I have in my portfolio? Is it a capital constraint? I don't have enough cash or enough equity to be able to continue to go. But hey, I have enough cash flow. And cash flow in this context is both personal and both earned and both active and, and inactive, right? So or active and passive. So your rent plus your income. So I either have enough cash flow in my put the portfolio of me but maybe I don't have enough capital or maybe I don't have enough borrowing capacity, but I've got to, so you get to look, there's three things. There's basically three potential bottlenecks. There's access to capital, uh, access to cash flow, and access to borrowing capacity. They're the only three real bottlenecks that you can face. And you can strategically maneuver your way through literally any one of those as long as you take the opportunity to really think it through. And so what that could look like is a number of things. If you, let's say you've already got a portfolio, right? Let's say you've got two or three or four, or five or more properties. You actually get to look at your portfolio and let's say you're stuck because you don't have enough borrowing capacity or you don't have enough capital or something like that, right? You get to then review your portfolio and say, okay, if I had to kill one of these assets, what is the lowest performing asset? And also, would it make sense to retire that asset from the portfolio, right? So you've got to make sure it makes sense. You know, think about your exit costs and all that kind of stuff. But top grading your portfolio is a significantly optimal strategy to apply. So you get to look at your portfolio and say, okay, well, I've got these four or five properties, whatever it may be. Which one has had the most growth and is maybe at the top of its growth cycle or it's ready or it's flattening out or whatever? Could I offload that property? And what would that do? Would that give me a bunch more capital to keep going? Or would that give me more, might give me some borrowing capacity back or whatever? The other way you get to think about it as well is, what does my portfolio need more of right now? This is a hypothetical, right? So I'm not trying to give anyone an investment advice here, but just to pose a hypothetical scenario. And there's just like, there's a bunch of ways to apply the principles of what I'm about to say. So don't take this as direct investing advice, I promise you, but just for the concept, right? Let's say you have a portfolio and you have got, let's say you bought properties in a trust, right? Because that makes it easy to think about because it's in a container, right? Let's say you've got properties in a trust and they are negative cash flow and you are not able to claim any of the tax benefit of that because the losses are isolated in the trust. And so you've literally just got a hole burning in your pocket. What could you do to offset that? You could think about a couple of things. Potentially, you could buy an Airbnb property. A lot of people are still renting Airbnbs. Potentially, you could buy an Airbnb property and inject cash flow into your uh, portfolio, not for the purposes of increasing your income and increasing your borrowing capacity, but for offsetting the negativity in the cash flow in your portfolio. You could also consider buying a commercial property. Obviously, you know, you could do the due diligence, make sure that's a good idea as well. But you could even think about, for, for what it's worth, you could think about buying a property in the US and think about how does how is that going to contribute to your portfolio. And so thinking about how you can actively and proactively diversify, you may even be able, depending on where your property is, you may even be able to um, put a granny flat on one of your properties to increase the cash flow in your portfolio to give you what you need to move forward. And so 
right now, it is the opportunity to look at that, where the critical constraints are in your portfolio, and then work out, okay, if I wanted to move forward, how would I do it? Because I genuinely believe that anyone can do anything they want. They just need to ask the question about how, how would they do that? And I believe there's a path forward for everyone as long as they have the desire to do it. Cool. Yeah. So I guess it's like, it's still reviewing where you are and what your portfolio needs, right? At the end of the day, it's being realistic and being honest with your current situation and then what you are trying to achieve and then reassessing based on the realities of what is actually happening right now. Do I actually, you know, I'm a little bit cash flow negative. How do I move forward? I still believe in property. I still want to keep pursuing this. So what other assets can I think about adding in that's going to support that? I think that's awesome. Mm, Exactly. And right. And so, but here's the thing, your limitation on your portfolio is limited by your capacity to think creatively around what the solution looks like. You might, for example, have a set of assets and somebody else has a set of assets, right? You might be able to do a joint venture with someone. I might say to my brother, just just hypothetically, because I haven't actually had the conversation with him, I might say to my brother, hey, I've got capital, um, but I've got no borrowing capacity. You've got borrowing capacity, but you've got no capital. Should we do a joint venture on a deal that is going to give um, both of us what we need or to progress our portfolio? Now, you've got to be, you've got to think about structuring and all that kind of stuff and definitely go and get professional advice, particularly if you're going to invest with somebody else to do, do a joint venture. But the thing is, you, the point that I'm making is that you need to think about your portfolio, not as me going and buying a set of houses, but think about it as a business and say, okay, well, Okay, so the business is facing some hurdles right now. If it was a business and you were selling, if it was a McDonald's franchise and people stopped wanting um, burgers, people stopped walking into the into the store, what would you do? Would you sit on your hands and say, I guess I'm just going to wait for people to come back and buy burgers? No, you would probably go, okay, well, where are people eating burgers? You would probably go, okay, well, how do I get in front of those people that want burgers? Should I change the menu items to attract people who don't want burgers? And you would start to think strategically around how do you pull the levers in your enterprise to make sure you can still achieve the goals that you've got. This is the zenith of what investors need to be thinking today. Yeah, it's actually a really cool analogy because if you think about McDonald's, like when a few years ago when it became really trendy to be really healthy, like, you know, vegan food, real health focus, the fast food chains, McDonald's particularly, like really struggled in that first phase when everyone, like the global trend was like, no, I don't like fast food. I'm all about health. You know, I'm going to get it. My body's a temple, that kind of thing. And then what did McDonald's do? Because they only had one type of asset, right? They just had the one kind of property. They had no diversification. It was like fast food, fish in, get it out, tick the box. So then they started bringing in, you know, they launched the cafe to appeal to like that kind of cafe crowd. They brought in more healthy. They brought in the salads. Do you remember when they brought in the salads? Yeah, Yeah, brought in salads. Because then, you know, when the global trend is more focused on health, they can still have an upside in terms of making revenue and getting benefit from that environment rather than just going, well, we're a fast food business, so I guess this is not our time because that's when things struggle and things go under and it's not good. Whereas if you think about it that way, if you think about your portfolio as like this empire and think about what are all the ups and downs and and kinds of trends that are going to come and how can I bolster my empire to have things that are going to withstand each of those phases. Yeah, 100%. And there's... There's no such thing as a bad asset. There's only bad asset selection, right? And so like almost every type of property investment kind of tactic or whatever, like whether it be apartments or options or flips or developments or granny flats or, you know, like whatever it is, they all have a place. You just need to work out what that place is and whether that place is in your portfolio. And if it is in your portfolio, why is it in your portfolio? And specifically, what constraint is it trying to help you solve? Because the only thing that any investor needs to work out how to do is not get stuck. The reason that property investors in the US can buy tens, hundreds, or thousands of properties is because it's a lot easier to avoid getting stuck. Now, the reason for that is because in in the US, if you're a US citizen or whatever, the liability is measured against the asset. So if you buy a property and it can self-support itself, then the debt is measured against that, not the individual. That helps with the constraint of borrowing capacity because you don't need to worry about the borrowing capacity so much. The key to success for any investor is literally just going, how do I avoid getting stuck? And if I can see a bottleneck in my flow, just like imagine that there is a pipe, like imagine there is a hose, right? Between you and your destination in life, that, that life of freedom, choice, and abundance, where you get to live life on your own terms, do what you want, when you want, with who you want, travel, do all of the things that you love. And you're actually traveling through that hose. There's going to occasionally be kinks. And then working out, okay, how do I systematically remove those kinks as I go to keep 
unblocking the bottlenecks. And if you do that, you're going to get to where you want to go. It's that simple. If you get to the first kink and say, well, there's a kink. Well, I'm just going to wait for the kink to unkink itself. And that's all I'm going to do. Then you're probably going to, you run a higher risk of actually never getting to where you want to get, get to, right? Because you're going to get out of the game. So my um, passionate advocation to people would be take stock and think about how you can do this more strategically. Now, I just thought it's a good opportunity for if you are in this position, we actually at Dashdot, we actually do help people to build property portfolio growth plans and we can model this out for you and help you to work out how to get there. So if you are going, hey, I want to move forward, but I don't know how, I don't know what the future looks like. I want to speak to someone, get some advice. I want to build a plan. I want to work out how to get over these roadblocks. Then just head to dashdot.com.au, check it out, book in a call, have a chat with one of the team. And we can see if we can like help you to navigate through those roadblocks because it is rare that there is a problem that can't be solved through strategic thinking. Yeah, for sure. And like this is the whole conversation is that please take the opportunity and the time to actually think strategically and slow down and think. So if you go back to the the racetrack analogy, it's like those that are on the track that can see forward the chicanes and the corners that are coming, they know like, okay, I need to break about now. I need to move this way a little bit. Whereas everyone else, if they're just looking just immediately in front of them, they're going to hit the corners and go, what the hell is this? <laughs> Yeah. Whereas the ones that can take stock and pause and think, okay, this is coming up. I want to get over there. Between here and there, there's all of these corners. What can I do now that's going to mean when I get to that point, I can pivot. And, you know, it's that. It's so important to actually just take this time. It's so good, right? Because li- literally, if you're, if you're riding a motorbike or if you're racing on a racetrack, that is literally the strategy. You don't look at the corner. You look through the corner. So I know because um, I've ridden motorbikes for years. If you're on a windy, you if you're on a windy that. mountain road, yeah, yeah. If you're on a windy mountain road, you don't look at the corner. You look through to the other side of the corner. Okay, you go. Okay, what does the other side of the corner look like? And then you move your way around there. And um, and so that's such a great analogy uh, for where we're at right now. So rather than looking at the corner and go, ah, you know, it's like it's right in front of me. It's like just look through the corner, move with it, and find the path through. I think it's a really exciting time because this is going to be what gives people the opportunity to develop the strategic thinking muscles that are going to set them up for success long term. And this is, you know, the property doesn't just go up in a, you know, I'm not, just to be clear, like property markets aren't anywhere near as bad as the media says, right? So I'm not trying to purport that the market's going down, but it's not a straight line and things go in cycles, you know, like regionals are still like going to perform quite well for the time being. And then there'll be a circular, then it'll swing back to capitals in a, net, in a few years from now. And, you know, all of this kind of stuff happens. And the more that you're able to bend and shift and move and think strategically and laterally and uh, and kind of like operate from a set of principles, I think the better off you're going to be as an investor. Yeah. Cool. And maintaining that constant learner mindset, right? Approaching everything yeah. with curiosity and going, hmm, what can I learn from this and how can I improve and adapt? That's going to really yeah. Yeah, set you up for success. The worst thing you can do is have a dogmatic approach. Like, And I saw that with property companies who said their whole like thesis around how to successfully invest was based around buying properties that you could subdivide and build a second house in the backyard, which is great. Like, Awesome. Great. Great until there's supply chain constraints. And all of a sudden, the cost of building materials goes through the roof and there's a two and a half year waiting list to try and build a house, then the entire thing doesn't work anymore. And so your ability to not be dogmatic in your approach, be strategically agnostic. Let's look at this from a very pragmatic perspective. Let's let's look at this from the theory of constraints and go, okay, well, where, where are the sticking points here? Where are the friction bits? And what does my portfolio look like? And what is the risk return profile that I'm satisfied with? And all of that kind of stuff, then you get to start to become a really intelligent investor. So I think all of this is great. Moments like this and times like this is really what makes it all worthwhile, I think. For sure. Awesome. Well, great episode, cool. Gabby. I think it's been super valuable. Good chat. We should do another one soon. What do you reckon? Yeah, we should. Let's let's hang out. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys um i hope you've enjoyed the episode if you have found this valuable uh, feel free to uh, feel free to shoot us an email and let us know and of course like rate review um and share this with a friend family member or loved one if whatever you're watching this on or listening to this on if it's on youtube hit the subscribe button if it's on spotify hit the subscribe button if it's on apple give us a five-star review um, show us a bit of love and help us to get the uh, the podcast out to more people. It really does make a big difference. And of course, if you want help to build a strategic and, and prolific property portfolio, even in the current environment and succeed when others may not, just head to dashdot.com.au and suss it out there. Guys, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.